to, 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 to slap you. What would you do to that robot? Uh, next question is for Pastor Joshua. The person is asking, I understand from the Bible that God does whatever pleases him, but I also most times do whatever pleases me. How does God's sovereign pleasure affect my day-to-day -day pleasurable decisions, even when they clearly dishonor God's command? Uh, you are not God. Exactly. Yeah. God does what he pleases. You can't. Because you are the porter, you are the clay, and God is the porter. And between the porter and the clay, the porter, the clay is at the pleasure of the porter. So you can't. You are bound by the laws of God. Your free will, because this question can be stretched to this idea, this theology of, of free will uh, or human autonomy. Humans are not autonomous beings. Even though we are not robots, we have free will, yes, corrupted by the fall, yes, but even our free will before the fall is a, a controlled and a regulated free will within the circumference of God's power and sovereignty. So you can't do what you want. And that was the scene in the garden. God said, don't eat of the fruit, then they try it their own way, and then all of us now are the testimony of free will. The next two questions for Pastor Austin, so I'll read them one after the other. First person, the first question is asking in regards to God's sovereignty, should we always, should we always act like Paul did when he said, don't beg me? You know, is that always the right way to act? If we are forewarned about danger, should we always say, they forewarned us, but we must go? Do you understand the question? I think, I think so. It's the question. So it's more like, is it an imperative, is it an indicative commandment that we must always behave the way Paul behaved? Okay. If you're running, if you're running and you fall and you hit your face on the rock, your first response probably will not be to say, oh, that was wonderful. <laughs> suffering is suffering because it hurts. And what the scripture teaches us is, picture Paul when he's being beaten. It's late in the night before he and Silas begin singing hymns unto the Lord upon reflecting not on how they feel, but on what they know of the living God. And here's what they know. When they look to Christ, Christ, for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame, and was set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Even Christ despised the shame of the cross. He prayed, if it were possible, that cup were to depart from him. But Christ found joy, and he found comfort, and he found power in looking beyond the suffering. And there, Paul gives us an example of doing the same. The physical pain itself, the suffering itself, is grievous. But those who are exercised by it, by the hand of a loving, disciplining father, can rejoice knowing afterward it will produce endurance in them and the peaceable fruit of righteousness. That's where we find joy. All right, this is a related question uh, to Pastor Austin. Yeah, I think to add to what Pastor Austin said, the answer is both yes and no. There's what we call Christian prudence. And we can give it to Paul that is an apostle. We are not. He does enjoy some level of clarity when it comes to knowing the will of God much more than we today can handle. 
So when you are like, like on the crossroad and you are being warned, for instance, if I'm a member of Pastor Tony's church and I had a desire to go and preach somewhere in, somewhere in Kotonou, he said, you know, say, son, um, don't go at this time. There is this, there is this, there is that. I think I cannot just go to him and say, oh, Pastor Tony, see, see Paul. When Paul was won by Agabus, he still went. So I'm going to disobey your leadership and your wise counsel, and I'm going to go, regardless of what the church is saying, that is foolishness. That is disobedience. If you are part of a body of Christ, you must listen to one another in such decision. Because today, we have young men running around our country who are just alone. God told me, God told me, God told me, and they're not listening to the wise counsel of leadership that God has set on their head. And that's why we are struggling as a people. So we are not Paul. You are not Paul. Thank you. Pastor Austin, uh, the question says, you quoted from scripture that the Holy Spirit bore witness to Paul that he was going to suffer many things. So how do I discern correctly what God will have me to suffer? How does the, how does the Holy Spirit witness same to me today? How do I discern when God is asking me to suffer? How does the Holy Spirit witness the same to me today? All scripture is God breathed out by the Spirit. The witness of the Spirit comes to you first in the written word of God. It says in Peter that the word of God came to us not after the will of man, but as the Spirit of God moved upon those men to write. So the wind of God, the Spirit of God, never blows contrary to the Word of God. And the Word of God communicates the mind of the Spirit of God that it is through much tribulation that we must enter the kingdom of heaven. These are general truths that apply to all of us. And so our first responsibility in having a right expectation is to have our mind renewed after the Word of God. And the more you read this book, the more the scriptures are in your mind, the more clear your expectations are aligned with what the Spirit says is the life of a Christian. And so there you can have confidence in what it says. So I think tomorrow I'm going to deal with that question. My topic is on how to maintain your confidence and, uh, and uh, witness. So please, if you ask that question, tomorrow be around, because the Lord has laid down some specific rules. This, if you do this, you will suffer. If you do this, you will suffer. And so once we know these things, we should be prepared for it. So tomorrow, God willing, we'll talk more on how to maintain our confidence, and you will know areas where you should expect suffering, and don't shy away from it. We have a tremendous amount of questions, so we need to try and <laughs> answer them uh, quickly. So this is a general question. What is the place of prayer in the sovereignty of God, especially as regards to suffering? I'll just read a Bible passage, and I think that will answer the question. I mean, I can quote it, but I want you to see it. So in James chapter 5, Verse 13, if anyone among you, is anyone among you suffering, then he must pray. Okay, sorry. That's the place. Okay, you want me to expound on that? I mean, that is the exhortation that James gives. He assumes, first of all, that suffering is part and parcel of the life of the church. And then he says to them, amongst many things, obviously, if anyone is, is anyone cheerful, he gives other guidelines. But concerning suffering, he says that the person must pray. That is the place of prayer. That is the expectation that the Lord has for his suffering saints and suffering children. That prayer is part and parcel, obviously, of the Christian, regardless of his situation at any time. T. We do not pray only when we are suffering, but we certainly must pray when we are suffering. Just to add to what he has said, we are to pray at all times. When things are okay, 
when things are not okay. But the problem, you know, is when things are not okay, when we are suffering, uh, when you pray, you don't determine the outcome. That's where we are having problem. Uh, it's not every prayer, what we expect or what we look for when we pray. We don't determine the outcome of prayer. That's what I'm you know, trying to say. So a lot of people don't understand this. You think that, okay, uh, God has said that if we pray in the name of his son, whatever prayer we have prayed is going to answer. That is not true because that's part of what we are talking about. God is sovereign and we must acknowledge that even in prayer. Jesus Christ, when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane, uh, he prayed three times that, uh, and he acknowledged the place of sovereign, uh, God's sovereignty. He said, not my way, but let your way be done. The same thing with Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians. He said he had a thorn in his flesh. And three times he prayed. So we must pray on all occasions. But the outcome still lies with God. Thank you, sir. This next to, uh, to Pastor Joshua says, since our God can, is you, Psalm 115 verse 3 doesn't have a location. So where are the heavens? So before I answer that, let me ask the next one. Do you understand? Mm -hmm. Next one is, are you saying that demons do not exist? So because you're saying, you know, when you're talking about people that were saying, oh, uh, territorial spirits. Are you saying there's no territorial spirits? There are no demons? Well, if that person was uh, listening to me, I will answer that question, but let me just give a practical thing to what Pastor Popola has said. When we are suffering, the, there is this idea of what I call positive confession that is popular. So I cannot be sick. I refuse to die. I refuse to die. I refuse to die. That is not the prayer of a Christian. The first thing should be, God, what are you teaching me? What is the purpose of this sickness that you've allowed to come into my life? Ask him to, ha to help you cope, to have grace to live through it, and say, if it is your will to take away this sickness from me, please do it. That's the Christian way of prayer, not to say, anywhere this sickness is coming from, I send it back to the sender now. That warrant you don't have. Then to the question that they asked me, uh, uh, I did mention that this is not a denial of uh, the existence of evil, of the devil, or deities. And I think I mentioned that in my second preaching that they are. But what we are considering here now is to look at the sovereignty of God in his all fullness and glory. Yeah, there are demons, there are devils, but we don't dare put them on the same scale with God. They are not, as far as God's equation is concerned, they are, they, are, they, are, they are insignificant. That's what we are saying. Because even the devil, as Pastor Tony said in the morning, is, 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 is in the hand of God. Yes, it's, and I think it's Arshu Sprau, and I was quoting him in Abuja, that Satan is God's Satan. Satan is God's, the devil is God's devil. And the devil cannot move an inch if God forbid, he can't, he can't, he can't do anything apart from God. And, and this is, I'm not going to be simplistic, we can add something to this, but we are not teaching, we are not teaching about demon and Satan here, we are talking about the, the sovereignty of God. Sorry, let me just uh, add something. Um, we all remember the story of Job in Job 1. God called you know, uh, Satan. Where have you been? You know, he's accountable to God. He can't do anything unless God permits. So the issue is not about whether demons exist or not. Whatever demons we do, whatever the devil we do, it is if God permits. If God does not permit, there is nothing that can happen, you know, behind God. That's, you know, the point that is being made. And that will actually help us to discard all this fear of, uh, if I go here, you know, the devil is monitoring me. Uh, there is an agent here. You know, we need to disabuse our mind of all of these thoughts so that we can uh, see God, where he is, how he is, and then 
we can live our lives. Pastor Tony, your answers comment seems to have a lot of questions. So I'll ask you two questions from the different angles on the same topic. So the first person says, does participating in a movement against bad government, like ENSAS, means we are rebelling against God's will, as the one is the one that moves and puts kings in place? The second person from the other angle says, can't God stir up individuals to confront oppressive rule to the point of changing the face of the government? And he gave the example of Jeroboam's rise to power during the reign of Jeroboam that God used Jeroboam to remove Rehoboam. Mm. Um, who is more powerful? Is it God or your effort? Your effort in organizing and your effort in writing petitions and so on. Who is more powerful? Is it God or your own effort? If we believe that God is sovereign and God is the God of the whole universe and God is able to raise a Cyrus and God is able to put Buhari where he puts him, why don't we just kneel down and say, Lord, please, may your will be done concerning this. And if truly all of us are true Christians, God will hear us. But most of us compromise a lot and we lose the power of the spirit because we compromise a lot. So that's the way to answer this. Um, if we are truly bent on proclaiming the gospel, it will be difficult for a Christian to join the answers. It will be so difficult because you have, there are people to talk to, to tell people about the gospel. You're busy reading the Bible to understand the Bible and plan a crusade and so on and so forth. Or you leave it and you're going to and if you check the answers go, the government set them up to check corruption but then the corruption rose and, and rose and wanted to uh, overset itself that, almost like what is happening in America about uh, defunding the police and so on and corruption is growing on so I believe that if the church would truly kneel down and say Lord God Almighty please this I believe that um, God will do something. So that's, that's the angle that we're, you know, bringing this uh, thing about answers. I'm not saying that if you are in government and you're able to do some reforms, asking God to help you to make the right policies and so on, you should be able to do that. Indeed, we are living in a corrupt society and uh, Christians should be able to do right all the time. But when it comes to organizing and going to stop uh, uh, block roads and um, stop the movement of business and so on, and you are there, and you know that so many livelihoods are being affected, and you are not even preaching the gospel there, then something is wrong with that. No, no. Uh, I'm going to ask these two questions together, Pastor Sage. Uh, someone is asking, is there a different pattern for suffering? That's a different Christian pattern for suffering, apart from the regular poverty of the land. <laughs> you know, problem with light, <laughs> and traffic. Is, are those the Christian suffering, or is there another one? Then someone else is asking, is being poor the same thing as suffering? And can you show me from the Bible? Uh, okay, so we live in a fallen world, and whether you are Christian or not, we bear the consequence of sin. So, um, if you want to start distinguishing Christian suffering, for example, in the midst of poverty, maybe tomorrow again I'll expound on it, but it, it comes to your Christianity when you have the opportunity to compromise and lift yourself away from poverty. But because of the Lord, you say no. And then it has moved from the general suffering that everybody is suffering into a godly one where you suffer for doing righteously. So um, naturally, because we are in this fallen world, we all suffer. 
And that one in itself has its own benefit. Suffering should lead us to look for the Lord. Suffering should make us abhor this world and say, isn't there a better place? What is causing this? And then you hear of the gospel. So that's, that is the thing. So then if you start suffering for being a Christian, it is still the same suffering. Someone asked me this question on Sunday that if I'm suffering as a Christian, will I feel it differently? No. It's the same thing. The Lord said my soul, was, uh, my soul is troubled. It's the same trouble that we all feel. It's just that you now know why you are suffering and you are able to keep your confidence. Poverty is as a result of a fallen world. For example, if your government is bad, it affects you. Bad policies come. It affects you as a Christian. But then, it is a blessing in a sense. If you read James, they who are poor pray more to the Lord. They wait on the Lord to eat their daily food. So, poverty is not necessarily because you are a Christian. But then, if you are a Christian and you are poor, it helps you to trust the Lord more. Other than uh, being like every other person. That's the bit. Tomorrow I will deal with some of these questions uh, in my how to maintain your confidence and witness in the midst of suffering. So I don't want to let out much now. There was a time when mankind existed in a garden and no one went hungry. There was one of every tree that was good to eat in that garden. No one starved. Everyone was able to eat and to feed. When sin entered into the world, death entered into the world. And in Genesis chapter 3, we have recorded with the man specifically in verse 17, unto Adam he said, because you've listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, saying, you shall not eat it, cursed is the ground for your sake. In sorrow you shall eat of it all the days of your life. And so now we eat in sorrow. Now man labors by the sweat of his brow, and is dependent upon the rain, is dependent upon the weather, is dependent upon the sun, is dependent upon the yield of the crop, is dependent upon that no one will steal it, is dependent upon the men delivering it timely to the right place. As Pastor Os uh, Osagi said, we live in a fallen world, we all suffer. But for a Christian, he knows that every hunger pain is a reminder of his greater need. Every hunger pain is a reminder of the curse, reminder that the wages of sin is death, and a reminder that he needs the bread of life, that a man may eat thereof and not die. Jesus Christ is that bread of life. And when the Christian suffers, he suffers as one who comes to know that truth more and more and more, grows in his understanding of his need for Christ, makes Christ the bread he eats and is satisfied by. And in this way, although everyone suffers, the Christian suffers uniquely because he is able to suffer with hope. And the unbeliever has no hope by which to suffer. And the Christian grows the more he feeds on that hope. Does that make sense? Okay. And also, um, somebody asked me after one of the messages, he said um, about, um, you know, uh, husband and wife and so on. So I said, if, if uh, there's some problem between husband and wife, then that should remind you of the fall. Because it's because of the fall that God said that the desire of the wife will be to the husband, but the husband will rule over, over, over her. So if there's any problem between a man and a wife, it's, to, it's a salmon on the fall. And poverty is also a salmon on the fall. It's a falling world and all these things that we can't explain. 
All this tell us that there is, that is God is actually, he has cursed this earth. And for Christians, as you, as you are reminded of this, it means that you should check and make sure that uh, you are not on the road to perdition. I hope it makes some sense. Pastor Tony, the NSAS thing generated a lot of heat. I have many questions here. But let me just ask only the one that the person made the strongest argument. The person said, Jesus stood against the bad leadership of his day, the scribes, the Pharisees, and the chief priests. So, so why can we not use that as an example? Okay, uh, my brethren will help me, but uh, I, why don't you stand against your general overseer? Okay, so I'll, I'll say briefly before and maybe any of the other speakers. Um, so the, I think Pastoria has really laid it clearly. The context in which the Lord Jesus Christ, you go to Matthew 23 and the woes and the scribes was with, re, was with respect to what? Their disbelief, their unbelief, the fact that they searched the scriptures but they did not see that it was pointing to him the fact that they stood in the doorway of the kingdom, they didn't go in and they hindered others from going in. Is that what your government is doing? So it's not exactly like for like. You know, the, the grounds for protest has to be carefully considered in light of Romans 13. You know, but the whole idea of using the religious leaders, there were civil rulers in the day of Christ and he didn't oppose them. I mean, the father she might go is John the Baptist when he called out Herod for marrying his brother's wife. And that's because it was a sin. The zealots that existed, of which one was a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ, was there any mention regarding their activities, any endorsement of their activities as something that was to be followed? You know, so we need to be careful here when we are considering these things. So it's, um, I know it's a heated uh, topic, but then we have to be very careful because number one, the NSAS protest, no one's, I mean, the, if there is a law in the land on how to protest and you follow that law, you can start talking about all these things. What was done was not was against the law of the land. So before God, everyone who joined that protest had violated the laws of God. The government is kept there to rule instead of God. They are God's servant. And the government said, don't block the road. Or don't take one way. And you say, because the Buhari is not good, you take one way. Buhari will kill you. When you get to heaven, God will send you to hell. Because you, you are breaking God's law. Now, the Lord Jesus Christ never stood against the authority, the ruling authority, which is Caesar. They, it was asked about, do you know how many tax they paid? They exacted tax on the Jewish people. And so they tested the Lord. Should we pay this tax to Caesar? What did he say? Give unto Caesar what belongs to Caesar. Now, when it comes to religious authority, and Pastor just said it casually, the only place we have the right to say, sir, this is wrong in your, in your church. We don't even do that. How many of us have walked up to our deacon, our Bible study leader, to say, Psalm 32 didn't say this. We can't even walk up to people in the house of God, preaching error, to say gently, this is what the Bible says. We don't have that mind. And that is actually what we should do. The Lord Jesus Christ, before he got to saying woe, in Matthew 23, from when he started his ministry, all his proverbs and all his uh, parables, he was exalting and pleading with the Pharisees to check their ways. He was using parables to talk to them that they are hypocrites until he got to the, th the two days before he would die, before he gave them the woe. So if you used Pharisee and the Lord Jesus as an example, you'll be indicting yourself. We must obey the authorities. Yes, it comes with suffering, but then we trust the Lord to give us a way out. The Lord, the, not, not one arrow was shot. To, to send the Israelites back from captivity back to their land. Daniel was praying. God raised Cyrus. Cyrus told them, go back to serve your God. Gave them free articles and gold. When are we going to be a people who knows God's will and pray and let God fight and use unbelievers 
to, to, to even help the church and straighten the land. I think it's something to think about maybe when we get to our homes. I'll stop there. Okay. I'm sorry. If I don't ask your question, I apologize. The, the time has run out. I would ask one last set of questions, or you can ask the speakers yourself your questions directly. So the questions are for Pastor Joshua, and the two of them have to do with the sovereignty of God and bad government. Uh, the first person says, if God is in charge of all the affairs of government, why is God not to be blamed for the ills of those governments? Why would God institute a bad government then he's not responsible? And then gave the reference, you know, when a righteous man is on the throne, people rejoice. Second question is, since God foreknew the fall of man, does it mean that he ordained his fall? And how does the scripture show that he's not the author of sin when he knew that man would sin, you know? Ah. <laughs> no, what I say ah uh, is that this question is actually putting the integrity of God for up for discussion. And I don't do it. And as Christian, if you have a Christian mind, one thing that must be clear to you is that there are some mysteries that we cannot comprehend in, in the now because we are finite. It's like asking, where did God come from? We, we, you know, and then that kind of foolish question that even your, this is your small brain, even if they are trying to, even if God wants to explain to you, you will not understand. I think this conference does not afford us opportunity to talk about God's sovereignty and human responsibility. And that can be explored some other time. What I want to say is this. God is sovereign. He ordains the fall, yet he's not the author of sin. It's a mystery that we will understand if God permits where we get to glory. Because if God is not sovereign, if God does not ordain the fall, how come it happens? What that means is that there's another equal power that determined what happened in Eden and God was caught napping. And if God was caught napping or unaware, he, he makes, he's no longer God. So whatever God knows, he ordains. That is the testimony of the scripture. During my preaching, I did mention that the evil that those who are in government does are never sanctioned by God. The killing the abortions that are sanctions, and the killings that are sanctioned, the assassination that are sanctioned, God will hold them responsible for it. He placed them there for the good of the people, but when they act against the law of God, which we know by nature there is a light of God in us, even if you are not Christians, we know the, between good and, uh, and right. You don't have to be born again to know that taking 10 billion from the, from, the, from the government is wrong. You know, you know, and God will hold them accountable for, for their sin. That is what I want to mention by passing. Some of those things are within our concept, our own capacity to understand. But God is sovereign. Whatever happens here, he understands. And by and by, it will be for his glory. For instance, the death of Christ. The death of Christ. Was Judas culpable? Yes. But God ordains, and that was found in the prayers of the disciples in the, in the book of Acts. He said, oh God, here in this city, your son was killed through the hands of wicked people. But it was ordained, it, it, it was by the determinant counsel of God that they were happening. Isaiah 54 tells us, is it 54? Uh, this 53? The suffering servants? 53. That it pleases God to squeeze his son. So in the death of Christ, who was really killing Christ? God. God was atoning for the sins of the world by himself in his son. 
But the human agents that were acting were acting also as responsible sinners that God will hold them accountable. So Judas could not say to after all it is in your mind, if you have already killed your son before the foundation of the world, so I'm free. No, that is not free. Yeah, that is the issue. For instance, finally, Alcee Sproul went as far, I don't really agree with him, but he went as far, that even the sin you commit, that the adultery you commit, you, you cannot commit, you cannot plan adultery successfully without God. And that was, and that was, that was tough for me. If God wants to stop you from sleeping with that woman, he will do it. And you should fear that you succeed in, in sleeping with that woman means God is judging you. But because God has allowed you, does not mean you are free for doing it. You are guilty for adultery. But ultimately, your own adultery, and then you commit adultery as a pastor, you are caught. And then you are paraded naked on the street of Oshodi. Other pastors that will have committed such crime will fear. You see how God is working through second agency. What they call, yeah, yeah. Sorry, uh, the time is over. Sorry, uh, I also spoke, Pastor Lee preached this. I don't know if you remember. And he said, the bandit that has gone to kill people. And he said, God was there. And went, how? If he didn't give them breath, if they wake up that morning and their hand did not move, would they go? The strength, the breath, the life that they had to move and shoot, it is God that gave them. And so the mystery, like you said, the mystery of God's sovereignty, and it's something unbelievable, and we all should just bow, at the point, just bow. And if asked too much question, Apostle Paul said, who are you, oh man? That's how I'll end it too. That's a wonderful place to end. So let's rise up on our feet as we sing <laughs> hymn 72 on page 5. Hymn 72 on page 5. Just the same. 